Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome, friends. I'm Diana Olbaum. I lead the foreign policy team here at the Friends Committee on National Leg Legislation. And I'm so delighted to see so many of you here joining us for this event, uh, which is uh, an opportunity to welcome our new general secretary, Bridget Moikes. Uh, this is actually her first uh, official public function as general secretary, although of course she is not new to FCNL. In fact, I think she is a prime example of the value of our investments in young people because she started here as an intern back in 1996. She came back later and headed up our foreign policy team, which is the job I now hold. Uh, from 2002 to 2006, and again from 2008 to 12. And during that time, she developed FCNL's Peaceful Prevention of Deadly Conflict Program, and she co-founded the Prevention and Protection Working Group. I think many of you probably remember her as assistant clerk and then clerk of FCNL's Executive Committee from 2016 to 2020. And while she was doing all that and leading another organization, uh, Peace Direct, she managed to get her PhD from George Mason's Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. She is an amazing woman. We are delighted to have her leading our team. And I will say welcome, Bridget. Thank you so much, Diana. It's so good to be with you, friends. I am so happy and excited to be here speaking to you from FCNL's office uh, on Capitol Hill. Really excited for this program and conversation with you today. It is just my second week in the office. And I have to say with all the things that I'm learning and um, getting used to, this conversation has been on my list as um, one I've really been looking forward to and anticipating because there's so much going on in Congress and there's so much work to be done and there's so much hope to be living into. Uh, just before I started uh, with FCNL, there was an op-ed by Amanda Gorman, who we all know and love, of course, and, and in it she said that hope isn't a promise we give, it's a promise we live. So I'm really excited to be here to speak with Diana and Amelia today for them to inform us, educate us, inspire us, and help us live into that hope as we continue this work to engage Congress in the issues that we care about. So without further ado, I wanna dive right in. There's so much happening in Congress. I wonder, Diana and Amelia, could you just start with what's on your front burner? What's keeping you busy right now? Amelia, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, I'd love to, uh, Bridget, and uh, it is so exciting to be here with you, and it, what a joy to, to see everyone's faces this afternoon. Um, so front burner, I have to say, build back better. I, many of you know, this was the focus of our annual meeting lobby visits. We thought it would be signed into law before the end of the year, and you may have been following the news. Um, it can sound pretty discouraging, but I have to assure you, Build Back Better, or some version of it, remains a top, top priority for the White House, for congressional leadership, for the Democratic caucus. Um, and we know that there are a lot of provisions within that um, legislation that have really strong support in Congress, including from Senator Manchin. Um, so the Senate's back this week. We expect negotiations and conversations to start up again around that legislation. We know that the scope of that bill is going to narrow down. We're not going to be seeing what uh, passed the House. It's going to look very different. But um, this could still be a very, very transformative piece of legislation. I mean, we're looking at the largest investments in clean energy and addressing the climate crisis in a way that we haven't seen Congress ever do before. Um, we're talking about policies that could dramatically improve how we support children and families around this country. So there's a lot of advocacy in front of us, um, uh, a ways to go, but I really, really think that we can get this done. And, and uh, that, is, that is top of mind right now. 
Thank you. That's so great to hear. There has been so much work on Build Back Better and um, some concerns about what might happen and some uncertainties. We've heard in the news about the possibility of breaking this up. You mentioned narrowing the scope. Uh, when I set up my email account, they said, make sure you put that you know, child tax credit lobby ask on your email to make sure we keep that moving. So can you just tell us a little bit more about what we might expect? Yeah, that's a great question, Bridget. So um, we don't know exactly what will be in or out, right? That's why that's going to be decided in the coming weeks. And some folks are saying, listen, let's just pass whatever's possible as, as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, others are saying, well, let's really look at what, what we what we think we can get done and try and push for for the thing that's going to be most transformative. Nothing's been decided. So in terms of the child tax credit, which I know so many of us have been um, lobbying on and, and focusing on, Manchin has previously said, um, uh, you know, he, he wants a work requirement with the child tax credit. We know that other things like child care, universal pre-K, clean energy incentives, some health care stuff, and the tax increases, Manchin has said he's, he's okay with. Um, but it's around the work requirement that he's really um, said some concerning things. Um, but I think uh, we really need to, to ensure that uh, reminding about the importance of the child tax credit, particularly ensuring that families with little or no income can claim the full value of the credit. Um, there has been, as you mentioned, some talk about breaking off the child tax credit and trying to move that separately. I want to be clear, like, there's no other vehicle. There's no other way to move the child tax credit. So if we're going to get it done, it has to be included in Build Back Better. And I just want to say there is enormous energy and support for that provision. Um, it's pretty much unanimous, almost unanimous within the Democratic caucus that this is one of the top priorities. Um, and so many think that there really is a deal to be had on the child tax credit. Maybe you um, lower the income threshold so that you don't have as generous a benefit to, to wealthier families, but um, there is uh, still possibility that we could get that in. But what we really need to do now is um, really press, press hard to pass a strong Build Back Better bill or whatever version it is, whatever it's called, um, with a strong expansion with the ch child tax credit, that there are no, um, that there are no work requirements uh, in it and that we know that families with little or no income can claim the full value of the credit. We know that is the single biggest driver in the huge drops of child poverty that we have seen. So um, you all have probably hopefully seen the litany of stories and data that is out there of what this child tax credit has done in just the six months that it was enacted and really pressing on the need to um, make sure that that is reenacted and, and ultimately made permanent. Thank you so much. It's such an important provision uh, among many important provisions uh, in Build Back Better. And so um, it's really uh, good to hear that we can still keep fighting for this um, and uh, working to get to get it passed. I want to bump over to Diana and foreign policy. Uh, Diana, I woke up my first day excited to come to the office and there the news was new potential war. We've put our sign back up, war is not the answer. Uh, Yemen situation continues. Uh, tell us more about what's on your front burner on the foreign policy side. Thanks so much, Bridget. Um, you know, unlike uh, Amelia, whose top front burner items are things that she has been working on for a very long time and working to get on the front burner. The things that we're, the foreign policy team is having to deal with this week are things we wish were not on the front burner and which have, um, have not taken us totally by surprise, but we're, but we're sad, frankly, that, that we are called to deal with this again. The first, obviously, as you started, to mention was the situation in Ukraine and on the border with Russia, with the massing of Russian troops there. And what makes the situation particularly distressing for us is the response that we're seeing in Congress, which is immediately to turn to the same approach that it has that that has been a failed approach to other conflicts around the world, which is immediately send in weapons and impose crushing. Uh, economic sanctions. And we know that this approach doesn't work. It makes things worse. It escalates the situation. 
Um, and, and it's just so hard when Congress feels like we must do something and those are the only things they know how to do. So while the Senate is working on this legislation on Ukraine, the House this week is taking up legislation on China. And although it's not quite as dire a situation because they're not talking about, um, it's not designed to deal with problems with Hong Kong or Taiwan, it is really placing the whole US-China uh, relationship in this very uh, adversarial framework, again with sanctions, again with punitive measures, and we're worried not only that this will exacerbate arms races and unhelpful forms of competition, but that it also advances a narrative that fuels hate and racism in the United States. So um, we've been trying uh, the best we can to get that message to the House and Senate. We've sent, uh, we've sent a hill blasts, meaning like emails to all the different members of Congress. We've written blogs and op-eds and signed letters, but it is it is tough going on those issues. Thank you. Wow. Um, there is a lot going on, isn't there? And I know that um, you've been doing a lot of work um, with the interfaith community, a lot of um, effort to lift up the issues around Ukraine. Uh, we had a really great conversation also this week with friends in Moscow um, and other places. So um, really important to, to keep this work going. It also reminds me, um, I have to say, having worked on th some of these issues before, it reminds me of... Um, you know, FCNL's long-term steady work that uh, keep on keeping on, as Ed Snyder always advised us, on these issues. So I wonder if you, if you look a little further ahead, maybe just a little further um, to this year, um, Amelia and Diana, how are you seeing the priorities and opportunities for progress um, in the year to come? Amelia, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. So Again, I mean, really build back better. Biggest opportunity that we have this year and probably for some years to, to, to come. So I think that, again, biggest thing. But then beyond build back better, we're also looking for opp opportunities in the upcoming spending bills, like funding violence interruption programs. We also expect movement on reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act with strong tribal provisions. Um, and then we are hoping that there may be an opportunity uh, on voting rights. And I'm happy to, I'm sure folks have a lot of questions on voting rights and happy to talk more about what that looks like in the Q&A. So on the foreign policy side, I see three areas where we have real opportunities for progress really in the next few months, despite how bad things appear when you're watching CNN or MSNBC or any of the news shows. There are three areas uh, where I do see opportunities for progress. The first is on Yemen, which our advocacy teams are working on this year, which is part of the reason I'm so optimistic. Uh, we are hoping to get introduced and pass a, a war powers resolution on Yemen that would call for the suspension of all US assistance for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. And this, this Language, uh, you know, the, a resolution to do just that actually passed both the House and the Senate uh, la in the last Congress. It was um, vetoed by President Trump, uh, and we didn't have enough um, we didn't have enough votes to overturn the veto. But this time, we think that um, President Biden, who has who has said that he um, wants to end all offensive support for for the war, will will accept it. So we think we can make progress on that. The second thing is uh, what many of you worked on last year as part of the advocacy teams, which is repeal of the 2002 Iraq war authorization. And again, we are just so, so close. It didn't get uh, incorporated into the National Defense Authorization Act as we had hoped at the end of last year. However, there is a chance that it will get wrapped up in another piece of legislation that's moving now where we're, we're um, we're not just crossing our fingers. <laughs> we are working with, uh, with Senate leadership, House leadership, and all our friends to, to make sure that it gets incorporated in that. And then the third area is, is in peace building. 
So first of all, I think we um, things are looking good for increases in funding for peace building programs and specifically the complex crises fund in the uh, appropriations package that uh, we hope will come out by February 18th so that the government doesn't shut down. Um, and we also think that during consideration of this uh, China package in the House, that there could be a good amendment uh, offered to end the artificial cap on US contributions for United Nations peacekeeping. Congress said you can't spend any more than 25% or we can't fund more than 25% of the budget, even though our dues are higher than that. Uh, and this would end that restriction. So we're hopeful that that can, that can happen quickly. Great, thank you. Those Some of those issues are really familiar. Uh, and I remember when FCNL lobbied to create the Complex Crisis Fund and that cap on UN peacekeeping. Wow, if we could end that, um, that would be important. Uh, I just wanna flag that in the chat box, there's some new resources as well on peace building and prioritizing peace, a great new uh, resource out from FCNL today. So flag that as well. So much going on, um, so much to do. So many difficult issues, um, not easy to persist with hope. Um, and so I really wanted to ask you, you're inspiring me, you're giving me hope, but I wanted to ask you, Amelia, Diana, you do this work every day. Uh, you do it in the midst of a pandemic. You do it with all that's going on um, in Congress and divisions in Congress, a more and more difficult Congress to work with. Um, all that's happening in the world. What gives you hope? What keeps you going? Sure, I can start off and then then Diana. Um, yeah, I would say three things. Like first, I, I'm going to come back to it, but right now in this moment, um, the, the possibility that we have with the Build Back Better legislation, even though it's not everything we imagined, when it started, this will still be a transformative piece of, of legislation, something that really doesn't come along all that often. So seeing um, within uh, talking with congressional offices, talking with White House staff of just the huge energy and desire to get that done, um, knowing that like no one's backing off from this, um, that gives me great encouragement and gets me real fired up to, to really try and ensure that we are advocating as hard as we can to get the strongest package we can across the finish line. So that's one thing. I would say that more broadly, I, I think about like, where were we just a year ago? You know, you think about coming off of the Trump presidency, Trump no longer being on Twitter now, and just the huge gains that we have seen from the American Rescue Plan as well. Um, I think, I just remember like our, at least my expectations were pretty high going into the, uh, the Biden administration and all of the things that we were really putting our hopes on that, that we would get addressed in his first year, let alone in, in one bill, you know, in Build Back Better, immigration reform, addressing the climate crisis, like addressing all the issues within our kind of in our economy. That's a really tall order for you know, just a first year of a presidency. So I think just like remembering what we, where we are, that we've still accomplished a lot through the American Rescue Plan. Um, and then finally, I would say the last thing is, is I find a lot of hope in community and doing this work in community is huge for, for me. Um, it is, you know, it, we are, we are wired for connection and community. And so being a part of the FCNL community, being a part of our interfaith um, community with our colleagues, doing this work together, knowing we're not alone and we're all pushing for this thing as a part of something that's bigger than ourselves, for me, is just um, incredibly, incredibly motivating. Yeah, and I'll double down on what Amelia was saying about community, because it's, it's, it's even more special than community in general, it is FCNL's grassroots networks and all of you who are here on the call, like knowing that you care, seeing how quickly you act when we send out action alerts, that we're reaching somebody, that there's people who care and they wanna be involved and they think this is important is, is just incredibly inspiring to me and making me feel like 
you know, we're not just whistling in the wind, that there are people who are listening and who care and want to act. And I'll, I'll especially um, give a, a, a shout out to the young people in our networks, in our community. I mean, I really see that the members of um, Generation Z, as well as millennials, seem to care very deeply about what's going on in the world. And they're not accepting things that must be the way they've always been. They're, they're, they're eager for change, they're active for change, and they want to be involved. And seeing that new generation coming kind of into their, their full ability to, um, to impact change is just really exciting. And I love working with them. That's wonderful. And I certainly agree with that because I uh, started, as you mentioned, as a young adult with FCNL and uh, uh, really wouldn't be here without this community. So uh, we are persisting in hope in community, uh, which is wonderful. So we don't, um, you know, end any talk at FCNL without telling people, what do we do next? So I want to turn to you among all these issues and all these things, and we'll get to some more in the chat box, I know in the questions, but what can our networks, what can our community do now? What's next? Sure, I'll jump in and then Diane, if you want to. So yeah, I mean, I've just been saying, I'm going to say it again, we need your advocacy on Build Back Better. So. Um, I know we're going to put some links in the chat of how you can just go and email your members of Congress on the need to get this done and really pass a strong bill that includes those clean energy incentives and also includes a strong child tax credit. So I think we letting our members of Congress know we are not backing down from this. There's huge energy to get this done. We want them to get this done, particularly with um, these two components is really important. And for me, hopefully you will see in the chat a link to take action on Yemen. This is a war we can stop, or at least we can end US complicity in it. There's bipartisan support for this. It's not just a democratic issue, not just a Republican issue. People can work together because they see that it is a humanitarian crisis and we are feeding it. And this is an easy thing to stop. We just have to stop selling weapons, um, uh, providing service to Saudi planes that are carrying out these uh, bombing attacks, uh, stop providing intelligence uh, to tell them where to target their bombings, stop providing, uh, you know, maintenance support. Those are things that can, can be done. And um, there are not that many people who contact their members of Congress about this and where it's not an issue that they're hearing from thousands and thousands of constituents, just five or six letters and phone calls can make a really, really big difference. So I thank you for anything you can do to help out with that. Great, thank you. So your letters, your messages, build back better, pass it, uh, end complicity in the war in Yemen, uh, get those going. If you've already written a letter, write another one, get a friend to write a letter, uh, get your meeting or, or a group to write a letter. Um, so thank you so much for that. We, I know there's lots of questions piling up and um, folks who wanna um, raise some more issues as well. So I wanna turn to Stephen, who's been monitoring our chat box carefully and ask him to help facilitate the Q&A. Yes, absolutely. We've got lots of great questions and a couple, Amelia, probably for you, uh, are related to climate change. And Phil asks about uh, efforts to ensure we're um, uh, supporting sequestration and efforts to do regenerative, regenerative agriculture uh, to help make uh, that more effective. And then relatedly, um, we have a question from Carolyn Treadway about uh, what in 2022 can FCNL be doing on climate change and, and the real global threat there? Thanks, Stephen. Oh, those are great questions um, on climate change. I, I think, you know, again, as I would say, Clarence and uh, Rosalie, who are working on our sustainable energy and environment program, are really, really focused on what can happen right now in terms of what's in the Build Back Better legislation. We've got 
over $500 billion right now of um, clean energy incentives and other efforts to address the climate crisis. Like that's, Congress is considering that right now. And so if we can get that done, that'll be huge, huge, huge. And there's additionally some other environmental justice provisions that they've really been looking at and are really trying to oppress. So I think that's what, what they're really looking at um, in terms of what they can get done. And that would have the most, um, the biggest impact this year. Um, but I think within that, there are so many things that, that we really need to be doing to address the, the climate crisis uh, in terms of some of the questions on the, the agriculture side. I know those are things that they've been looking at as well. Um, and I'm hopeful that we might have a blog up in the not too distant future on some of those um, provisions. But uh, this is a, we're, we've got to we've got to look at all options on the table. And so but the, the stuff that they're really looking at now for the next uh, month or two is really what's in the Build Back Better legislation. Great, thank you. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't put your chat, your question, if you have one, the chat box is the best place for it. Um, so please do um, use that. Stephen, do we have a, a few more? Yes, a question from Jonathan about the renewed Iran deal. Probably that is for you, Diana. Uh, and Stephen, is there a specific uh, part of the question or just generally about the new? Generally, can you give us the state of the, the, of the Iran of, nuclear deal? Yeah, actually. So uh, my understanding is they just wrapped up the eighth round of negotiations in Vienna. And the hope is that um, the next round will be the final round and they will come to some kind of a deal because there is some concern that uh, Iran's... Um, uh, nuclear activities will get beyond a point where it's easy to go back to the original deal. Um, what really gives me hope in this is the number of people from Israeli military generals to uh, Democrats and Republicans who's, who have now admitted that getting out of the deal was a bad idea and recognizing that we're much better with, uh, with a deal where you I mean, the whole nature of a deal is you have to have a compromise. Nobody's going to get 100% of what they want. And that's really important for Congress to understand. That's the nature of negotiations. And they tend to want to be maximalist about this, right? Unless they get every single solitary thing they want, they criticize the negotiators and say it's not a good deal. Well, uh, what's the alternative? Um, you know, uh, the, the possibility of a nuclear war with Iran is, is I, I don't know how anybody can even contemplate going there. So let's, let's find a way forward at the negotiating table. And it does, at this moment, it's looking positive. So we're, we are working really hard, especially with faith communities to speak to our friends in Congress and people who have been um, suspicious or cynical about these deals and tell them, look, don't wreck it. Don't put on all kinds of negative conditions that would make it impossible to move forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions, Amelia, on voting and voting rights. So uh, first, a point from Karen, if everybody voted, uh, that would go far in making sure we have the country that we want, um, which is related then to voting rights and people's access to voting. And Deb asks about uh, any hope of furthering voting rights uh, this Congress. Yeah, that's a great question. And we were, you know, pushing really hard for uh, the Freedom to Vote John Lewis Act uh, to, to pass earlier. Um, a couple weeks ago, um, obviously that, that did not happen. And uh, a real big blow. I mean, especially we are very concerned about what we are seeing in state legislatures across the country. Um, the path forward at this point that we are looking at is there is a bipartisan group of senators who are looking to see if they can do something um, around voting rights and uh, election protection. So they are they are meeting, working to try and come up with something. And uh, we are seeing, well, what can that package look like? Are there provisions of the Freedom to Vote Act that we can include in there um, that would, uh, that could, could at least make some difference um, now? It won't be everything that is needed, but for example, 
having state legislatures being able to overturn election results, like you can't out organize around that, right? So that is incredibly, incredibly important. Some of those things are just incredibly important that we get um, we get now. So I think we're looking right now at what is possible for us to move in a bipartisan way. And then there's just gonna be, have to be a lot of voter education, voter mobilization efforts um, coming up to, to ensure that people really are able to access the ballot. But it's, yeah, it's going to be a big challenge over the next, over the coming years. It's a big issue um, that we are, that, you know, our democracy depends upon this. So um, we're looking at kind of every avenue that we can really see, see um, reforms and change in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and this, I think, will be good for Bridget. Um, so Robin asks, for those of us living where our congresspersons, our senators are already voting in support of our priorities, what would can we do? How can we help? And she's in New Jersey, but I'm, I'm sure lots of people feel that way. And we might have ideas of uh, influencing Senator Menendez in New Jersey as well. <laughs> Yes, so please, Diana and Amelia, jump in. Um, I mean, I would go back to FCNL basics, relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, even if there's not uh, the immediate ask this moment, keep the conversation going, explore what more, what's, what's the next issue, what's the next ask, what's a relationship that member has that you could ask them to leverage with other members? What's a committee that they're influencing or on that you could start um, asking them to play a new role in? So there's so much about the ongoing work of relationship building um, with members of Congress that never, never stops, that um, whatever the issues, even if they're already doing that work, those rela relationships, you never know when they'll come back and be so important. Um, we're also thinking a lot about, you know, what is our role as FCNL and as this community across the country in helping bring people together and heal the divides that are in our country. So continuing to talk to your members of Congress and others in your community um, about how we work together and how we uh, bring more people into this work with us. So that's that's some of the, the, the things that come to mind when I think about, you know, that question, Stephen. But feel free, Diana yeah. and Amelia. Yeah, I'll just build on that a little bit. Um, first of all, you can say thank you because there's nothing that members of Congress love more than to hear thank yous from their constituents. And it is just super important to relationship building. The second thing is that if they're already say voting with us, we have something that we call like a, a, a ladder where you can move people up the, the, to become stronger champions for it. So maybe now all they did was vote for it. Next time, maybe they can co-sponsor it. Next time, maybe they can introduce it. Maybe they can be on TV making speeches about it. You know, there's always something that you can do to become a bigger champion of an issue. But I would also say that, you know, specifically with New Jersey, Senator Menendez, who chairs the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, is one of the ones that we are most concerned about with respect to Iran. He opposed the Iran initial Iran deal and was very skeptical about any new deal. And I did see a note in, in the chat about, you know, why, why don't we just get a treaty? I would love to see treaties that we could just pull out of. The problem is that getting 67 votes in the Senate for anything is such an unbelievable hurdle that the complete the, the the treaty process has completely broken down. And I'm really I worked on a lot of treaties when I worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff. The INF treaty was one that you know I spent an awful lot of time on. Um, but I don't I don't see new treaties getting approved anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah, I'll just go. I mean, I echo everything everyone said. I there are so many offices where I've been in where the member says, yeah, I'm with you. And like Diana said, it's like, but being with us when the vote comes, it isn't enough, right? If the vote never comes, we don't get there. So a lot of times we need them to really make it a priority. So that's talking to leadership. And as Bridget said, talking to, to key members, um, people who they have relationships with and that sort of thing as well. So I, uh, yeah, just echoing what everyone said. Great. 
Um, thank you all. And then looking um, more at the chat, we have a couple people who've asked specific questions, Diana, about nukes and uh, specifically the amount of money we're spending on nuclear weapons and how it could be used on other areas. Uh, John brings up uh, solar power as an area where we could be using some of that nuclear uh, weapons money that would be a huge, make a huge difference. Uh, and then uh, Alan also talks about um, move the nuclear weapons money campaign and the efforts to get it to shift to other areas. So can you say some about our work on nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons funding? Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. There's almost nothing that would be a worse use of money <laughs> than, than nuclear weapons. And we have tried so many different ways of talking about better uses for this money. When it was when COVID um, you know, first came out, use it for our campaign was masks, not missiles. When people couldn't remember, we couldn't get masks. Um, when build back better, I mean build back better, we, we haven't been able to get through a bill that is two trillion dollars over 10 years. And yet Congress has no problems authorizing what will come out to be $7.5 trillion for the Pentagon. And it is, it is, it, it's, it's deeply troubling and upsetting to me that um, we have only mostly been able to convince the people who already agree with us that it's a bad use of money. And so now we're starting to think of other ways that we can frame this to get people to understand that nuclear weapons are something that is too terrible ever to be used. They are different from other kinds of weapons and we can't treat them like other kinds of weapons and they must be banned. That's gonna take a long time because right now uh, our, our country threatens to use them, holds the world hostage to them. And moving away from that is gonna take, is gonna take a lot of work. We're looking at legal angles to see if we can prevent first use by using the War Powers Act, about international legal angles, like um, how it is conceivable that nuclear weapons could ever be used in, in uh, uh, pursuant to international human rights and humanitarian law. So we're, we're, we keep thinking of how can we reach the people who don't agree with us? Because it's very, like to, to all of us on this call, it's, it's so obvious and it's so clear that this is a waste of money. But we need to figure out how to speak to the people who, who don't already agree with us. Absolutely. Um, and there's so many good questions. We won't have time for them all, I don't think. Stephen, can you give us maybe one more and then we'll, we'll start to um, look to some reminders and actions for folks? Before absolutely. We absolutely. There's so many uh, good questions, as you said, and several people are talking about Build Back Better. Um, Amelia, an opportunity for you to clarify here. Um, about the possibility of breaking it up and how do we get it through the stalemate right now. Uh, so if you can clarify and help us uh, focus on that issue, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm really, yes, because there has been a lot of talk about breaking it up and trying to move it in different pieces. I'll just say like, that's just really not an option. There aren't, we don't see a path to be able to get 60 votes in the Senate for other pieces of the legislation. The using the process, the reconciliation process, which is the Build Back Better kind of process right now, they can only do that once and that allows them to get it through the Senate with the simple majority. So that's why there's really a lot of skepticism about moving it in different pieces. Um, that being said, um, I think there, it, you know, it might not be called Build Back Better, but I think everyone is looking at what can get through? What is what will that look like? And again, there is pretty much unanimity within the caucus to really try and get something. Um, and we're waiting to see kind of where where does Mansion land? And he has been supportive of a lot of the stuff that's in the House bill. So it's just trying to figure out what are those pieces that you know they can really kind of get behind and move. But that's where I think 
every like it, it is a mansion game but every member plays a role because again we were talking about many of them have relationships with mansion they're trying to talk to the white house we saw a number of senators give a letter specifically to the white house talking about the importance of the child tax credit so i think it is uh, there is just a lot of energy to try and get this done it's not guaranteed it could all fall apart that's why your advocacy is so so important at this very moment because i think the next few weeks are really going to determine the future of this legislation. Great, thank you. What an important moment and opportunity and stay the course is what is what I hear Amelia telling us. Keep keep going um, on Build Back Better, pass Build Back Better. Great, well, we are going to need to wrap up soon. But before we do that, I wanted to turn to this um, question of how in the world does FCNL select its legislative priorities? There's so many issues that we're working on. How does that get done? And I know Amelia wants to share, update us and remind us a little bit about this process. Yeah, thanks. So yes, this year's an uh, FCNL priorities process year. So the policy committee has uh, just met last weekend. So we ur urge all of you in your meetings to, to kind of get together and um, go through that discernment process. What do you think are the top priorities that FCNL should work on? Remember, this is the list of in the 118th Congress, what are those issues that FCNL will dedicate staff time and resources to work on? We can't work on every single issue. There are a lot of issues that we want to work on, but you know, what are the top priorities that you really think that FCNL should be focusing its attention on? So those submissions are due April 12th. So just make sure that you, you schedule that with your meetings and, and participate because we really want to hear from as many, as many of you as possible. Thanks, Amelia. I can't underline how important that process is um, in helping guide our organization and staff in deciding what issues we are going to lobby on, where we put our time and energy, where our lobbyists focus their efforts across so many issues that uh, we know this community cares about. So please do participate. Uh, we are um, eager to get the input. Um, I know our policy committee will do tons of work um, to listen and discern through all that input and, and with um, the governors and with staff uh, perspectives as well. So please do participate in that. Um, thank you so much for being part of this. This work is about community. And so we are so grateful that you are here, that you're there in your communities taking actions um, with your meetings, with others, with advocacy teams, that you're engaging your members and you're engaging others and that you're joining us um, for these events. I know that Diana, Amelia, and the rest of our staff are going to keep you updated on these issues and what comes next. Uh, we have a lot of work to do this year. I am so, so happy to be here doing it with you all. It's so wonderful to see you all on the screen. And I really look forward to the next opportunity we have to be together. Thank you so much. Keep on keeping on and persisting with hope.